welcome everyone to Science Thursday with Brookhaven Lab. Uh, just the purpose of Science Thursday is to engage our student and education community in STEM topics by meeting BNL STEM professionals, learn more about their work and career paths that got them to where they are today. At the end of the 45 minutes, we hope that you will you have heard uh, something that will spark your interest in, in, a, in a, a career in STEM and perhaps even consider being part of the Brookhaven Lab community. I am Aleida Perez. I am from the Office of Educational Programs, and I'm joined by my colleague, Diana Murphy, who will be vanishing the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Before I introduce my very special guest, uh, a few reminders. Please submit your questions using the Q&A chat at the bottom of the uh, uh, Zoom app. We will try to do our very best to answer as many questions we can today. And if you have any issues or difficulties with the video stream, you can let ITD, IT know by making a comment on the chat section. All right. So it is my pleasure today. I am joined by Ernie Lewis, an atmospheric scientist in the Brookhaven and Climate Science Department in the Environmental and Climate Science Department at Brookhaven National Lab. And he, Ernie is going to talk to us about today about aerosols, climate change, his, and his research expeditions, and also talk about a little bit about his career path too. So welcome, Ernie, how are you? Thank you, I'm doing well today. Nice to be here and welcome everyone. Oh, wonderful, wonderful to have you here today. Uh, before we get going, um, and I know we're gonna spend some time talking about your career path and so forth. How long have you been at BNL? So I started at Brookhaven in 1994 in the oceanography department. We had an oceanography department here. Oh, you did. And the focus then was on the carbon system, carbon dioxide in the oceans, ocean acidification and, and climate change. And we did field programs. We would go all over the world on ships and measure ocean water. And then when that program ended in 1998, I moved to the atmospheric sciences department looking at the surface above the ocean. And we study clouds and aerosols. And again, our group is focused mainly on doing fuel campaigns and um, you know, going out, collecting data in the real world, bring it back and analyzing it. In addition, we do laboratory experiments, computer simulations and so forth. Sounds like a very, you know, there's a little room for everybody's interest. It's, it is, yeah. Whatever your your specialty, your interest is, there's a place for you, and it's it's a diverse set of opportunities. So you're not stuck doing one thing all the time. There's a lot of variety. Very, very cool. I actually looking forward when we start the conversation about your field work because I think that's just exciting. And that's exciting, the fun, exciting part. The fun part it is. Fun part. So uh, I know that we talked about that your research focus on aerosols. So, so for the people that may not be aware, that may not know, what are aerosols? So an aerosol is a suspension of very small particles in the atmosphere. And the unit we use to measure is how many particles in a cubic centimeter. So most of you know what a cubic centimeter is. It's a little smaller than a sugar cube, if you know what a sugar cube is. And right now, Regardless of where you are, I would guess everybody is experiencing between 500 and 1,000 or so particles per cubic centimeter. So these are in the, the size range of a tens of nanometers to several hundred nanometers for the most part. And you can, if you remember your science, you know, an atom is roughly a few angstroms, which is a few tenths of a nanometer. So they're pretty big in that sense, but they're much smaller than most of what we see or encounter, but they're very important. So you uh, show a slide. The first slide shows sources of, of particles in the atmosphere. Let me get to that very quickly here. So anyway, if you think about this, you can, a good fun problem is how many aerosol particles do you breathe in during the course of the day? So dust particles are in the atmosphere. Most of these are large enough you can see them. Sea spray from breaking ocean waves or coastal waves, volcanic emissions. Biomass burning produces soot and forest fires, industrial combustion. And these are some of the obvious ones, but there's a lot of other sources, what's called secondary sources, where gases uh, cluster together and form small particles, usually in the upper atmosphere, and then those are brought down. But these have different chemical compositions and therefore different properties. And um, we try to study where these particles come from, we try to characterize how many they are. We kind of characterize their properties, their optical properties, their chemical properties, 
how they take up water and so forth. So that's, that's our research and that's what the instruments we work with do and the models we work with do. That's fascinating. And, and I know that uh, people have heard aerosols, you know, recently in the talk of COVID-19, right? The, in terms of the right. understanding how those, those little uh, droplets move around in the air. Right. So in the older days, people worried about aerosols from an aerosol can. And this was in some sense a misnomer. And, and mm -hmm. if for those of you old enough to remember or have read um, the ozone hole and they said aerosols were a problem, the propellant in aerosol cans, hairspray, spray paint or whatever, contain chemicals that when released would go to the upper atmosphere and destroy the ozone hole. The aerosols refer to the particles that came out and they did not do that. So it's kind of a misnomer. Yes, with COVID, when you sneeze or whatever, you send a, a, a range of sizes of small droplets out and these refer to, to aerosol particles or to droplets and they make an arbitrary distinction at a given size as to whether it's a drop or a particle. Um, but right, so, so these are small particles. Most of the ones we deal with are even smaller than the ones that you sneeze out or whatever, so very- Yeah, that, 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 that even smaller, right? The ones that you mentioned that we sneeze out. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been curious. So there are small, there are, these are very small particles. These are very, very small. What kind of tools you need to have or you use in order to measure this very small particle. Right, so there's some very creative tools. Before I do that, let me back up and say, why do we care about aerosol yes. particles? Mm -hmm. And one reason is they affect climate by various ways. Well, we get all our energy, nearly all our energy from the sun. So if an aerosol particle is in the atmosphere, like some of the pictures we saw, they can scatter light, which means some of the energy won't make it to earth, it'll go back to space. Some of the dark aerosols from biomass burning can absorb light, meaning that changes the heat in the atmosphere. Every cloud drop that you see forms around an aerosol particle. So aerosol particles are possibly most important for climate because of their impacts on clouds. Um, you will not have clouds without aerosols in the world. So we want to know the chemistry of them. We want to know their sizes and so forth. And obviously, as we've talked about with COVID and with some of the other Pictures there, aerosols are important for health. You're breathing in millions of these particles a day. Some of them contain chemical substances that, that might not be as healthy as others. Some like sea salt probably aren't that bad, but some from industrial sources and so forth might contain compounds that, that cause health problems. So we designed instruments that will take do various things. One, we can measure the bulk properties. We just send air through a channel or through a filter. We measure the light transmission through it. Sometimes we send it through mass spectrometers and we take individual particles and break them up with the laser beam and look at individual elemental components. We can take individual particles and put it through a supersaturated solution of butanol to where it grows to a size that we can detect it with an optical particle counter. So sometimes we detect them optically. Sometimes we look at their chemical properties. We have a little machine that makes a mini cloud and we send particles through there and see if they grow and form cloud drops. So we're basically making a little cloud in a machine. We count the number of ones that make a cloud drop. And then we know in a given volume of air at a given relative humidity or what we call supersaturation, how many of these particles are going to form cloud drops. And by looking at those from different sources, we can get an idea of what the properties of the particles that we measure are. And that matters, right, Ernie? Because the type of chem, the, the, the chemical composition of whatever those aerosols are would impact, for example, the, what, how that cloud will behave, whether it will rain or not, and so exactly. forth. The, the chemistry and the size of the particles are important. Uh, the number of the particles are important. We also collect particles on filters and put them under electron microscopes to image and look at the different compositions and chemistry in there. Well, that's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of putting everything kind of on a perspective when we when we look at our sky or we look at our surroundings and environment. Right. Look at clouds and look at the different types of clouds and, and think that, gee, every, every drop in a cloud, which isn't yet grown to the size of a raindrop, forms around a single aerosol particle, so. Um, it, this is a question that I will ask, maybe because just curious. Um, when you look at, at, at these aerosols and the chemical, composition, is there anything that is in quite common among this aerosols that kind of right. give it, you an idea? A lot of where they are on Long Island, where I am now, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, we have, depending on the wind, a very marine source. So if it's coming over the ocean, we expect a lot of sodium and chloride in some of the particles. If it's coming from New England, we might expect some biological uh, particulates, so a lot of organic substances that are emitted by trees and so forth. If the wind is coming from the, the east, I'm sorry, the west, it's coming through New York City or New Jersey, we're gonna have a lot of industrial components. So a lot of diesel emissions, a lot of organic components and so forth. So by looking sometimes at, at the uh, chemical composition, you should have a fair idea of where the air is coming from and vice versa. If I look at a, a wind map and say, well, the last three days, the wind's been coming here, then I go, well, gee, it probably has, I would expect to see these chemical compositions in there. Sulfur is a big component and the sulfur cycle uh, is, is a very interesting one and has driven a lot of the field because sulfur is contained in, and that's why the Department of Energy was originally interested in. Oil has sulfur, coal has sulfur, yeah. gasoline has sulfur, all these things. And that's, you know, back in the old days, again, most of you aren't old enough to remember, but sulfur goes to the atmosphere, oxidizes, rains out, forms sulfuric acid and rains out and, and the, the pH in the lakes and the Adirondacks were between two and three, so no, no life could survive in that. And that was purely an, an artifact of the coal burning plants along the Ohio River Valley, producing sulfates that would go up and be transported downwind, which is where we are here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm old enough to remember to know, you know, the acid rains, right? Acid rain days. Yes, as, acid rain and, and, and the implications of how we um, use sources like wood, for example, and others. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm old enough to know that, to remember those days. Uh, so I, I, you know, one thing that I, I find very, very cool. Oh, by the way, my uh, our guests, you're welcome to put our your questions in the Q and A section anytime. Um, one of the things that I do find interesting is that in order to do this kind of research, you have to leave the island, right? You have to travel from time to time, depending where you what your question, your research question is. Well, yes, yes and no. Uh, we don't have to leave the island. We've done field programs here. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, and Department of Energy, especially that, that we work for, has fixed sites, measurement sites around the world where they send instruments and we ship them from here. We can run them remotely from our computer here and set them up mm -hmm. to do measurements that we can analyze here. But yes, we do travel, we do field campaigns. Um, I did one that went back and forth between Los Angeles and Hawaii. We'll talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, there was just, I was just off a call and I'm working on a paper from one that um, we're looking at biomass burn from South Africa that comes over the Atlantic Ocean towards South America. And there's a small island called Ascension Island, if you can find it on a map in the middle of South America that we had, Department of Energy had a measurement station there for a year and a half where we took measurements and we're analyzing those data. I had a student intern last semester looking at those. And, um, you know, I didn't go there. Some of my friends got to go there, um, which was nice. They liked it. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we do measurements there and then we bring them back and, and take the data and spend the next couple of years working them up and analyzing, trying to get a story, trying to get better explanation mm -hmm. for what's going on on that. So yes, we, we can do measurements here on the island. It's a great place, but we also leave the island whenever we can to work in the field, which is one of the challenging but fun aspects of the job. Oh, one of the perks, right? From time to time. From time before, to time. before we talk about that, that the expedition that you were referring the magic expedition, uh, this is a, a this type of research is a very collaborative research, I'm assuming. So, so uh -huh. uh, you have collaborators throughout, not just the United, not just around oh, the United the States, um, throughout the world. Right, we work with other Department of Energy labs. In mm -hmm. fact, I just got out of a conference call, off a conference call from this one, where it was people from our national laboratory and another national laboratory that we're working very closely with. Um, the Department of Energy has fixed and mobile sites at various places around the world. So there are technicians from other national labs. We work with NASA and NOAA people. Um, you know, we're scientists, so we don't, um, we don't pick teams according to our boundaries, right? I mean, Correct. you know, we go to meetings and you see people from universities, you see people from NOAA, from NASA, from around the world. And these are the people you work with if you're interested in the same thing, you say, yeah, let's get together and talk about this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extremely collaborative, yes. yes and that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the fun aspects too, is getting to meet people from all over the world and get to know them and, and work with them too. Yeah, that's, I agree, I agree. So let's talk about magic. You, okay, I'm gonna share the screen so I can start okay. 
So MAGIC was a field campaign that I led, uh, well, Department of Energy led, I was the chief scientist in 2012 and 2013, and we were interested in the formation of clouds over the Pacific Ocean. And, and it's hard to make field measurements. Uh, the next slide, if you, there we go, there we go. So it's hard to make measurements over the ocean. It's very expensive to get a research ship. They cost about a million dollars a month. And if you wanna do a whole year or something that gets quite pricey, um, it, it's hard to have access to that. It's, it's expensive, it's challenging in a lot of ways. So we found a company, Horizon Shipping Lines, which has since gone out of business. And they have a ship, which is a very old ship, which is good for us. If you look at the top, you see the ship and it's a container ship. It goes back and forth between Los Angeles and Hawaii or did. Uh, every week, every two weeks, it's on a two week cycle. The stacks are the white things you can see about two thirds of the way back on the ship on the left there. And that's good because all the emissions from the stacks are gonna go behind us and we're mm -hmm. not gonna be sampling the smoke from the ship. All the living quarters and everything is in the white region in the front where you see the mass. So we had three vans up there. There's a picture of me with the little balloon mm -hmm. if you're looking at balloons on the bridge. And we would go on the ship. There were three technicians that lived on the ship for, you know, we went most of a year. I did two or three trips where I would go and, and help them out and travel. You're launching weather balloons around the clock, 24 hours a day. You're doing measurements. Everything's running the whole time. And we're trying to understand properties of clouds and aerosols over the ocean. And the difference is the clouds near the coast of Los Angeles or off the coast of California are generally a stratus deck. So if most of you are in high school on Long Island here, you look up today, I look out my window and it's just kind of gray and overcast. But as you get closer to Hawaii, the clouds turn into these puffy, like the nice cumulus clouds we get in the summer. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to understand, and by understand, we mean not understand, but be able to write in a computer model that's gonna do and give results this. We're trying to write a computer model that will mimic the world. We wanna project the world do a computer program that shows it and then say, what if I increase the temperature? What if I increase the carbon dioxide? And we didn't have a real good understanding or a real good representation of these clouds and partly because we didn't have real good data on it. So we had three radars on this ship. We had three C-tainers, the size of the ones there, full of basically laboratory grade instruments that, that we deployed for the year. So that was the MAGIC field campaign. And MAGIC is an acronym for something, but my, uh, co-investigator leaned over once during a conference and said, if this works, it's really going to be magic. But it, <laughs> it, we had very good results from that and had right. a number of papers that have come out on that. Before we talk a little bit more, uh, there's a question that just came, that just yeah. uh, came in the Q&A. said, did you have a favorite class of aerosol that you enjoy studying? <laughs> I do. I like sea salt aerosol because Why? one of the first things I wrote was um, on sea salt aerosol. So uh, it, I, it was, I studied it a long time. I learned a lot about it. I gave a lot of talks about it. So I, I know that might seem like an odd question, but I don't think so. Uh, I always have a preference to sea salt aerosol. So whenever my buddies, somebody says that they all look at me and laugh and point, but I'm a sea salt aerosol guy. You can, if you Google my name and sea salt aerosol, you might, you might even see something on the web. So. Oh, that's very cool. Very cool. So the magic, so when you went to this field, what kind of information, you just said you, you had your set, your instruments on the ship. So you were gathering uh, data information about the, the, uh, the, the clouds, the aerosols, right? The, the temperature. So everything. So we had a meteorolo meteor meteorology. We want to know the wind mm -hmm. because the winds are going to drive a lot of this. So we have temperature, pressure, relative humidity sensors on the ship. We had uh, wind gauges on the ship. We had aerosol instruments, probably a dozen. We had three different types of radars and several other types of equipments that were pointing up, sampling the atmosphere remotely, LIDARs, which is like a radar except with visible light. We launched weather balloons either four or six times a day, which gave us vertical profiles up to about oh, 20,000 feet of what the temperature and pressure and relative humidity and winds were. We had radiometric sensors to measure the incoming light because we know how bright the sun is. If we measure and there's a difference, it's because of things in the atmosphere that scatter. So that gives us more information on how much energy comes from the surface, how much energy goes away from the surface and so forth. Because we're doing an energy balance, basically. The sun sends energy down and that's what drives the climate. And the whole climate change issue of the last century or so is we're putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so we're sending the same amount of light down. That doesn't change the sun. 
but the amount of light or energy leaving the earth is changed. So that changes the energy balance. Um, so I mean, I'm just going to move. Uh, let me know if you want me to show the other pictures, images that you have. Uh, but at the end, uh, hold on, move the other. These are the kind of instruments that you have on on the on the on the on the, on the horizon, correct? Yeah, these were all the different instruments. We had aerosol mm -hmm. instruments, we had cloud instruments, we had uh, radiometric, meaning light measuring instruments. We'd measured the light intensity of various wavelengths coming down in the infrared, um, total energy coming down from the sky, little sun photometers, and so forth. A uh, lot of different types of instruments. I'm and just then we gonna, like weather balloons. Weather balloons. So. I'm going to get to that one because that was that was actually a cool one. You want to tell a little bit about this one? Yeah, do you have the, the next slide? So yes. what a weather balloon is, they launch them at the lab twice a day. There's about a thousand around the world that are launched. It's a little packet that's, uh, there'll be a picture of one. When this it's right comes. here. I'm not seeing a new slide oh, yet. You... I still see the same slide that was up there. Oh, you do? Yes. There is a little delay. Uh... Anyway, it's a small packet, um, size of your fist, and it's got a temperature sensor, a pressure sensor, a relative humidity sensor, a little GPS unit to tell where it is, and then a little radio transmitter because you have a receiver on the ship. So you fill up a weather balloon with helium, you launch it, which can be a challenge on a ship like that. Most of the time it's in a nice field with no trees around and, and you hope for no wind. The ship's moving at 21 knots going to Hawaii. There's a lot of cables. There's a lot of containers, as you can see. So we had a pretty good success rate though. And then this weather balloon goes up. I still don't see the slide, Aleda. Oh, that's interesting because I see it. Uh, let me up uh, uh, as Diana, she sees it. Yeah, might just be me. Somebody can put it in the chat and they see the slide. Anyway, so the weather balloon goes up and as this thing rises, the pressure decreases as you go up. And then at each point, you know, the pressure, you know, the temperature. They don't know. see it either. No, I'm not, not progressing. Progress. So I'm just gonna stop the share and try again, okay? Okay. That's what we're doing in the... We're adaptable here. Yeah. All right, can we, do we see that one now? Not yet, I see a black screen. Okay, technical difficulties. Technical difficulties you right now, let me that. figure it out. You can play with that, I'll keep talking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, what do we get from this? Well, we get at every elevation, we get what the temperature is, we get what the pressure is. And as you know, the temperature is supposed to go down as you go higher or else it's an unstable atmosphere. Um, you know, and we have what's called an inversion, the top of clouds where we get a more stable atmosphere. So we're trying to measure how strong that is. That's what keeps the clouds down. So anyway, before we, we went on this, nobody had ever, no, nobody from Department of Energy had ever done this on a ship before this was the first time. So me and a couple of buddies went the first time to say, okay, where are we gonna put these containers? Where can we launch weather balloons? Um, wh you know, wh wh where is it gonna work? So the first time we're doing it, we had some weather balloons, but uh, still no, okay. Um, no, we'll try to get one more time, keep, keep going. Okay. okay, you want me to share my screen? I can pop it up. Let me try to pop it up. I think it's something might be mine on my end. Okay, let me, let me find that slide. And then, uh, and then in the meantime, before you while you do that, there's a question on the chat, uh, Ernie. Do you? Um, what I missed it. Can everybody see that or no? Do you see that, Alita, or no? Uh, I do. Okay. Yes. I okay. Do. Good. On the right is a little weather song. So some of them, of course, smash into the containers. And the crew was very kind. They would put it on my plate at breakfast the next morning just to remind me how we'd messed up. That's okay. We take it good naturedly. But it's got all the electronics and so forth. Uh, on the left, I was mentioning this one time. This is a little wind vane up here. It's an ultrasonic wind anemometer. And it sends between the two little um, points sticking up, it sends sound waves. And sound is going to travel differently, different speeds with the wind than without. So if you have three of these, you can get your two wind directions. 
So one time it's not working right. We're sitting in there and we just say, so, something's not right, it's not working. And the wind was coming from the right to the left across this. So we went out and looked and this is a brown booby. It's a bird we don't get in the US, but it's a tropical bird that nests on islands and it's sitting right in front of this. So that it was blocking the wind and we were getting a little vortex on there. So, okay, this happens in a field campaign. This doesn't happen in your laboratory. But I was saying we went out first to launch our weather balloons and we didn't want to put the radio suns because they're a couple hundred dollars each. So we said, well, what's about the size of those that's biodegradable, that's cheap, that we can launch? So while we're at the grocery store the night before thinking about it, we said, hey, fruits and vegetables, that's perfect. So instead of just do it, here, here's, you can see the launch. This is the weather balloon. It's about, oh, six feet in diameter, two meters in diameter here. You can see the little radio sun dangling below it. And sometimes they smash right into containers there because the ship's going to the left, kind of the opposite. You can see the, the balloon going that way. So we would tie one of these on there and we decided, you know, look, we might as well have, have fun with this. We're scientists, we took 20 balloons, two of them burst, and these are the vegetables we put. So we'd tie one of these vegetables on instead of the radio sawn just to see. The squash tended not to work too well because they either broke when they were launched <laughs> or they went in the ocean. Turnips work good, sweet potatoes work good. Avocados are kind of hard if you drill them to tie them on, they're really messy. And the rutabaga has got moldy after a week. So as scientists, we always document everything. Okay, I'll stop showing my screen, but um, you know, you have to have fun. We're out there working really hard. You're working around the clock. You might as well have fun with it. We're scientists, we like to explore. So that's, that's what we did in magic. That's very cool. Which was the best vegetable, by the way? Uh, the the, the uh, sweet potatoes work. Sweet potato, well. the best. Yeah. It's a question on the chat. Do yeah. you work with NASA Glove Observer Cloud Study? Is that the one that once uh, so that they go mm -hmm. ahead? Is the NASA Globe? I don't know if I, if I said it correctly. Not NASA Globe Observer Cloud Study. I, I think, think that so. There was there, it was. I think it's changed. There was something over the. Uh, at that time that somebody from NASA contacted me and we would take measurements of clouds from the ground that we would just observe and say, this is a fraction of cloud cover, this is where we are. And they would want, and they have schools do this. So I think it's the same school program. And, yes, they it would, is. and then they would have a satellite that would go over. So I'd get this schedule every time I'd go out of, okay, at this time I'll go out and look. And they want you to ground truth that basically the satellite flies over and takes a picture and they're trying to do a, a machine learning type thing, automate it and say, you have this many clouds of this type. And to see if that's true, I'm on the ground, I'll look up and I'll fill out this form that said, we have puffy cumulus, 30% mm -hmm. cloud cover and all that. So yeah, we interacted with them. I met, I think at a conference once, I met, I met the woman at the time who was doing it, but it had a different name then, but I thought it, it had was, changed, but it's the yeah. same program. Yeah, it was same a great program, program. Mm -hmm. school groups to go out and, and you start learning your clouds, you start looking up in the atmosphere and going, why does that happen? And that's what sparks scientific curiosity. All right. And, and they're still running. I think they still, they do have yeah. some as, some community science or some engagement, like crowdsourcing observations and so forth, you know, which is very engaging. Yeah, for, for young folks. There's a question on the chat. Uh, you mentioned the ozone hole, acid rain, and how we learn from the science and make changes. Are you optimistic that we can learn from your models and reverse the effects of human-induced climate change? Oh, I hate to be not optimistic. Um, so I was reading an article not longer that summed it up well. We've known the causes of climate change for over 50 years. We've had no major breakthroughs in the basic understanding. We're trying to quantify how fast, what the consequences are and so forth. So the problems in solving climate change are not scientific in the sense of solving climate. They might be scientific in the sense of finding fuels that aren't carbon emitting, finding better solar cells. It's mostly changing human behavior. You know, people still want to fly to Hawaii and Europe and as soon as people get their vaccines, travel is going to go up. That all puts carbon in the atmosphere. We know that. So I can learn whatever about clouds and so forth. But if people don't want to modify their behavior, there's nothing we can do as scientists. Nothing's going to change in that sense. Yeah. I hope that's we, not, we, the I science teaches so you know the trends and so forth. It's up to us to make the decisions. Right. So it's not, not a scientific problem in some mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of magic, and I know how long did that? Uh, uh, we went how, 
2012, September 2012 to September 2013. Oh, okay. And then okay. I had plans for a Magic 2, and the shipping company went out of business, and then I had plans for another ship, and it, it got, it never ended up working, but there was potential for more, more things there. So at the end of so at the end of the campaign, what was the take home message from this study? We had a great data set, have a great data set of a lot of radar observations, a lot of uh, very intense. Uh, there were two intensive observational periods where we launched weather balloons every three hours, which meant, you know, I stayed up basically for a week. I got no more than an hour of sleep at a time, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I got eight hours, but in one hour chunks. Um, most weather balloon locations like the one, the National Weather Service on Long Island here launches two a day, but we were doing eight a day. So we got a lot of very good data and that's gonna be very useful for people doing computer models to show which, which different parameterizations are the best, which models work better and so forth. Uh, so um, we are on about on a 30, 430 something. So let's just make a pivot here and talk about your career path. So you've been here being of, oceanography group right so how when did you know that you were interested in science when you said oh i am going to be a scientist today when i think in high school i thought i was going to be a mathematician because i always liked math but where i went to school yeah, i like science but i took a physics class in high school and really liked it and realized that i can do all the math i want and you know, incorporate it with the physics, which I really like. So I got a degree in physics. I'm, I'm a physics major. And how did you end up from being a physics major into being atmospheric scientist? And I, I know that they are not, um, you know, they're not, diff there's a lot of complementary understanding right. and work, but. It wasn't a traditional path by any means, and I'll spare you all the detail, but my wife <laughs> got a job at Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, mm -hmm. So we moved up here for her job in 1993, and I applied to various departments and got hired in an oceanography department. Um, and what I did there was, you know, they, they had a new instrument came in, I built it, I wrote a computer model for it, I took it to sea, uh, you know, within three months of the time I got here, I was out on an oceanographic cruise, and I was not an oceanographer by training. So it was a lot of fun. I went out and we measured stuff and got a nice data set. And then I, for the next several years before it ended, did uh, a lot of oceanographic cruises in various places of the world that were pretty interesting. That's actually very cool. That's like, you know, it's a, we all take a path. We, everybody has a path to take right. to wherever mine, that, mine that was, might be. Yeah, convoluted, but I, I that's what got <laughs> there. Um, so if a student it is uh, interested, uh, there's a question here. How many years in college did you study for your current profession? Very few for my, well, it's hard to say. I didn't go to school to be an oceanographer or an atmospheric scientist. I was a theoretical physicist. So I did four years as an undergraduate and I won't say how many years as a graduate student, but more than most of you will ever do, I think. Um, th there's somebody in our group who last week, I, he mentioned something and I started talking about it. He goes, I'm surprised you know that. And I said, I probably did more years in graduate school than you did. You got a PhD and graduated, but I probably did more years than you did. So a lot of years in graduate school, but everything I learned was useful. It, you know, you learn not specifics, you learn how to solve problems. You learn how to think about things. You learn uh, different approaches to problems to where when you see a real world problem, which is what I like about oceanography and atmospherics are real world problems. You're out in the field and something breaks, you have to fix it. You have to figure out how to measure what you want. So it's problem solving, but your skills that you worked on in classes and so forth help you approach those. And that's what I like about it. Yes, think it's, 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 it's thinking right at the spot, you know, taking all right. that knowledge that we gain throughout time and how do you apply that, you know, and sometimes you have to apply that fairly quickly uh, yeah. at, at, at that moment. Um, if, I has, if a student uh, is, is, you know, we have students and, and educators listening and a student wants to uh, pursue a career in STEM, whatever that might be, in, as an atmospheric scientist, for example, what kind of preparation you would suggest a student, even in high school and college, to consider? Oh, take all the math and science you can. Uh, pretty much every aspect of science can be applied to what we're doing. We have a group in our department that does uh, terrestrial ecosystems, meaning vegetation and plant regions of the earth. 
They go to Central America and do measurements from plants. They go to the Arctic and look at methane fluxes from the peat moss. They're biologists, basically. You know, most of the people in our department are chemists. I'm a physicist. Whatever we have electrical engineers, we have computer programmers. Whatever you like about STEM, study that. But I would say take as much math as you can. That never hurts. Physics is very good because it gives you the basic principles of things. Chemistry is very important because that's what determines what things are made of and what reactions occur. So whatever you like, take as much of it as you can. And I will add to that, consider a computer science. One of the things that I do, did not do in my time was to take a computer science course. So I, I didn't mention that because, uh, and maybe incorrectly, I assume most students are, are much more versatile at that now than I was when I was in high school. But yes, definitely take yeah. programming and learn to do that. When we have yeah. interns, and they're usually undergraduates, the first thing we do is give them a, a program that we use and make them learn that. Yeah, even if you're thinking that you're going to a biology field or that you think, oh, I'm not doing needing this, it's, 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 it's a something to, that really to consider. Right. I, I know you're a great mentor because you mentor a lot of high schools, a lot of our college students from a science undergraduate laboratory internship program, the DOE funded internship. And I know you have also mentored high school students as well as high school research program. Uh, how important are mentors? I mean, you're, how important are mentors in, 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 our, in, the, in the development of the next generation or, or of our STEM professionals? I don't know if I'm the best one to answer that. I know I certainly enjoy mentoring younger mm -hmm. students. Um, they have insights and so forth that, that I don't sometimes. It helps me to clarify my thoughts. If I explain it and they look at me blankly, that means maybe I'm not explaining it, which means mm -hmm. maybe I don't understand it as well as I thought I did. Um, I, I think it's crucial that, that undergraduates and high school students, if they can get involved in research. And, and that's what I feel it's one of my responsibilities is, is, to, is to be a mentor, to help them as much as possible. Um, I think it's vitally important. I, I, think, I think so. I think uh, high school students and college students do, if the, an opportunity comes around to you to do an internship in some form of STEM experience, I will encourage them to take to take it, uh, and 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 because those are the experiences that uh, you know that that gets you along the path of of, of the field that you may want to end the, up being. The other thing I, I tell all my interns, I said, look, the skills that got you to this point aren't necessarily the skills that are going to get you from here on out. So it. it at the point that you come and, and work with me, for instance, the answers aren't gonna be in the back of the book. I don't know the answers. We're trying to figure out the answers. Right. So you can learn all the science you have at school and that's very important and very necessary, but there's other things, how to interact in the scientific community, how the social system and science works that you can't learn from a textbook. And that's why a mentor can help very much as to how to deal with, how to publish papers, how to deal with other scientists, things like that. And, and that's why I think it's an important to do research and to uh, get, get an internship at some place if you can. Those are very important experiences. Right. Um, as we, uh, very important So um, is there anything that over the, uh, uh, that you will give us an overall advice to an audience at the? I mean, do what you like. You know, I, I have a buddy that I work with very, very closely and have for a dozen years and he'll look at me and go, they're paying us to play. I mean, we're, you know, we might be working long hours or you're on a field program. Like I said, you know, you're getting eight hours of sleep a night, but one hour chunks, but who else do you know that has a chance to be on a cargo ship going to Hawaii, do it launching weather balloons, you know, that's pretty neat. And, and my mm -hmm. friend, you know, has flown on, on the NASA plane off the coast of Africa. And I think he lost weight when he got back. It was pretty brutal, <laughs> but you know, that's a fabulous opportunity. So, you know, we like that we're problem solvers and not everybody has that mentality, but you know, once it's solved and we have an answer, it's not as interesting anymore, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we like to do. So, so find something that you like and, and you don't want it to be work. You want it to be play. Lesson. So I yes. go in and it's like, I, I want to do these things today. This is interesting to me. And, and before we, 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 we kind of, you know, uh, start winding down. Uh, what are the expeditions? I know that we are uncovered right now. Any other expeditions that are coming up on your way? Any other interest? Any other expedition projects that are coming your way? There's several 
Well, at least two uh, big field programs that people in our group are leading. Uh, one is going to be in Houston. It was sparse to have started, uh, I think, April or March, and they postponed it. And I think now it's going to be September, but it's going to be uh, basically a set of vans of research grade instruments and a lot of weather balloon launching and radars in, in Houston, Texas for I think a year and a half. And then, and I, and I might go down and visit, but probably not in official capacity, just as a vacation. I have friends there and, and my friend is leading it. So I'll, I'll go see him and see how it's going. And then um, one of the Department of Energy sites that they're going to put is in the Southeast US. And that'll be for five years. And our group is uh, fairly um, instrumental in that. And, you know, it's going to be a long measurement campaign. There's going to be a lot of new equipment now, because in the last, oh, since my fuel campaign, they've miniaturized, they have instruments that are tiny now, and they can put them on balloons, and they can put them on drones, which is a big thing. If you like drones, oh, there's a big, big field in science for there. So, yeah, so you're able, you know, said that a lot of more instruments gather more data too as well. Right. Right. And that's something that more data, more better understanding. Right. Any other questions from our audience? All right. Thank you, Diana, for putting out, uh, for sharing the uh, BNL uh, education website for the, our for Brookhaven Lab Edu Office of Educational Programs. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Aleda, if you just want to, since we have a few minutes, um, yeah. there were questions coming in if we just wanted to talk about the different um, internship opportunities sure. that are here at the laboratory. Sure. And I would also point out what your group does very well is the summer science program. They should all go mm -hmm. to that. And, and other science programs, there's the uh, trivia night and so forth that, yeah. that Outreach does. Yeah, I agree. So we have the, for the high school students, we have the high school research program. Uh, that is uh, actually applications are, are, are will be done uh, are due April 6th. I encourage you to apply if you are 11th and 12th grade student. If you're a college student, we have the Science Undergraduate Laboratory Internship or SULI. I think the applications for the fall semester are open. I encourage you mostly to apply. And then we have also our summer science exploration workshops. These are week long workshops that we offer at our office. They all be virtual this summer. But it will be an opportunity for you to 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 get a sense of what the top, what is out there about STEM that you might not not you know explore a little bit. This is something that might be of interest to me, and then you get an opportunity to kind of see uh, in detail oh, certain STEM fields. If you are a community college student, we have this community co community college internship or CCI, also through the, the Department of Energy, and the applications for the fall term. Are, is open. So I encourage you to, to, to do visit those, uh, those uh, the, explore those opportunities. They are a great experience. I did one of those back in 1990, I will not say too much, 91, uh, at Argo National Laboratory. And uh, it, it does, uh, it can really be a life changer for, 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 for you. So I do encourage you to do that, right? Thank you, Diana, for that. All right. So um, thank you, Ernie. It has been a pleasure to having you here today. Um, we appreciate uh, the work that you do and, 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 the, and the sharing for the insights about aerosols, understanding the climate, the impact, the uh, relationship to climate sciences and clouds. I love the, the, the whole images of magic. I'm not sure if I will be able to do that very much because I must have motion sickness. I don't know if I can, that might be I have motion of work. Too, but you do? The ship is so big, it moves very slowly. It was a very ah. nice ship to be on, yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe next time you take me with next you. Next time, I'll set it up. You can work on that. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for folks out there, our next Science Thursday is April 15, and our guest speaker is Kayla Hernandez. Okay, thank you so much. Please be safe. Make sure that you wear your mask. And before we go, I'd like to thank Brookhaven National Lab for hosting this event and encourage you, like I said, to check our programs. Be safe, be well.